Welcome, everybody. On behalf of our family and amazing co-hosts and friends, Mark and Kate Shaw, we wanted to welcome you all to tonight's event in the support of the Cure Alzheimer's Fund. We are so excited to have you all here joining with us in what we hope will be a fun and useful evening. For those that I don't know, my name is Alicia Brash, and my husband Sam and I live in Marin County with our three kids. I'll let Sam share more about the details of the night and the Cure Alzheimer's Fund, but I wanted to start with this thank you to each of you by participating and being part of this event and effort with us. Alzheimer's has been part of my family like it has for many of you. I lost my mom to the disease almost 20 years ago with early onset Alzheimer's disease. Through the great work of people like Rudy Tanzi and many of the researchers that the Cure Alzheimer's Fund support, Sam and I are hopeful that we will one day have a cure for this disease that has affected so many of us and our families. That's it from me, but I'll let Sam continue. <laughs> Thanks. Um, as Alicia mentioned, you know, Alzheimer's has been a part of, of her life and our life since her mom was first diagnosed when Alicia was only in her teen. Um, and over the last couple of years, Alicia and I have, have been trying to find a way to get more involved in, in supporting efforts and advancing work in this field. And, and through the kind introduction of our friend Russ Glass to Henry McCants, we learned about the great work of the Cure Alzheimer's Fund. You know, Henry and his co-founders started the organization 20 years ago with really just one goal in mind. You know, how can they and we all support the researchers and the research that you know will drive the innovations that ultimately will lead to a cure for this disease. And, you know, as we've gotten to know the organization and, and people like Rudy Tanzi, who chairs their scientific advisory board, we've been amazed by the work they're doing and excited about the chance for things like tonight and, and other ways to get involved in supporting their work. Um, you know, I'll leave it to the Cure Alzheimer's Fund experts to tell you more about the organization, um, but we just wanted to share how excited we are that you get to be part of this event with us um, and, and that we all get to learn and hear from Rudy, who really is one of the world's foremost experts in this field. And, and we're so excited to have the chance to hear from him and chat with them about what's going on in this space. Um, you know, before I stop, and, and I will stop at some point, we also just want to say thank you, you know, for Kate and Mark and Alicia and I, this is a new effort and, and you know, getting involved with a new organization and trying to figure out how to bring our friends and family together in an event like this. Um, was actually much easier than we ever would have expected because you all were so wonderful and the support and encouragement we received from you all and your participation really means the world to us. So thank you all for, for joining us and being part of this with us. You know, special thanks for, of course, for those who, who pulled together groups and friends and, and organized tables and sponsored the event. So, you know, Robin and Russ Glass, um, the Letman, Klein, uh, Lynn and Nielsen families, um, you know, some of the other sponsors, you know, the Ron and Teresa Cook, you know, Russell Hirsch and his family, uh, Sharon and Alan Levy, John Ragone, um, you and, and everyone else who's on this call, we really couldn't appreciate it anymore and, and are so thankful that you were able to join us and support us in this way. Uh, I, I will stop here for now, but again, we hope you enjoy the evening. We hope we all learned something and, and we're glad that we are able to be here with you. Good evening, and thank you so much for being with us tonight. My name is Meg Smith. I am the uh, Executive Vice President for Research Management with Cure Alzheimer's Fund. And I just want to start by saying how grateful we are to Kate and Mark Shaw and Sam and Alicia Brash and all of the other hosts and sponsors for this event and to all of you for joining us at all and supporting the research that is bringing vital answers to the Alzheimer's community. As you heard, Cure Alzheimer's Fund exists with just one mission, to find an end, find a cure and bring an end to, cure, to Alzheimer's disease. Um, we are guided in that mission by Dr. Rudy Tanzi, who will be joining us tonight, and he will be talking about the progress being made in the fight against Alzheimer's disease and steps that each of us can take to preserve and improve the health of our brain. We will have the opportunity to take questions at the end of his presentation. If questions come to mind while he's speaking, please use the chat function at, in the Zoom menu bar um, to enter the question and I will send those to him and we will have about 15 minutes at the end to answer as many questions as possible. After the question and answer session, we will have the further pleasure of, song, of a song from singer songwriter and Broadway star, Chris Mann. After Chris's performance, we will move into breakout rooms for dinner. Now, let me tell you about Dr. Tanzi. He has so many titles and accomplishments that it would take the entire length of time that we have together tonight to tell them all to you. So I'm just gonna talk about a few. 
He is the Joseph P. and Rose F. Kennedy Professor of Neurology at Harvard University and the Vice Chair of the Neurology Department, Director of the Genetics and Aging Research Unit, and Co-Director of the Henry and Allison McCants Center for Brain Health at Massachusetts General Hospital. Although we won't get to hear him play tonight, you may have also heard him play keyboards on albums from Aerosmith and others. Since our founding, Dr. Tanzi has served as the chair of the Cure Alzheimer's Fund Research Leadership Group. In that role, Rudy leads our affiliated scientists in guiding the Cure Alzheimer's Fund scientific agenda. Dr. Tanzi has been a passionate leader in the fight against Alzheimer's disease ever since first discovering familial Alzheimer's genes that determine early onset for most people who suffer from it. We are grateful for his scientific drive and his vision and his leadership and for sharing all of them with us tonight. Without further delay, here is Dr. Rudy Tanzi. Thank you, Greg. I, uh, it's a pleasure to be here and um, I, I hope everyone uh, can hear me okay. Um, uh, I wanna thank the Shaws and the Brashes and Cure Alzheimer's Fund for putting together this wonderful event. Um, and uh, I, I look forward to sharing with you my excitement about where Alzheimer's research is right now. And to be honest, I'm, I'm, I'm most excited right now uh, because the Cure Alzheimer's Fund has allowed us to make so much progress over the last several years that um, it really feels like we're starting to see the light at the end of the tunnel. You know, um, Alzheimer's is a terrible, terrible disease. And one of my points I'm gonna make tonight is that it begins very early in life. It begins way before you see symptoms. And so that means if we're going to treat this disease properly, a big theme tonight will be that we need to be proactive and not reactive. Um, Barron's recently had this uh, cover uh, of the other pandemic, uh, Alzheimer's disease, uh, losing some sight of that while COVID-19 um, really dominates our thinking in the healthcare system. Uh, but Alzheimer's is still the most common form of dementia in the elderly. Um, nearly 6 million patients in the U.S. alone, over 300 billions per year in cost. But if you take how many people have Alzheimer's pathology in their brain, especially after 40 or 50 years old, already starting to make what are called plaques and tangles in the brain um, before symptoms, without symptoms, it's probably about 38 million people. So, you know, with diabetes and heart disease, other diseases, we, we look for this path we look for pathology early. We start treating early. And in Alzheimer's, we wait till the brain degenerates to the point of dysfunction, and then we try to be reactive and then treat the disease. This is what we have to stop. Um, risk factors for this disease include age, number one, family history, head injury, gender, two thirds of patients are women, so women are particularly vulnerable, and they have to do with postmenopausal changes in energy metabolism in the brain. We're not exactly sure why women are more susceptible, and. Given that the fastest growing segment of the population is over 85, and depending on the study you read, anywhere from 30 to 40 percent or 50 percent of those over 85 already have Alzheimer's symptoms. And current lifespan is already 80 years as well. This is a tsunami coming, the silver tsunami. It's an epidemic in the making, and cases will triple by the middle of the century and have the uh, capability and potential to just completely uh, collapse Medicare and healthcare. With this disease alone. So let me. Um, uh, so this disease was was first described by Dr. Lois Alzheimer, shown in the bottom panel. And that was this patient up top. Her name is August Dieter. And it turns out she had a familial early onset Alzheimer's mutation in the pre one gene, a gene we discovered in 1995. He didn't know that then, of course. This was 1906. And she was admitted into this uh, Bavarian asylum called Aaron Schloss. And he wrote in his journal, he said she was a 55-year-old woman with memory loss, hallucination, screaming for hours in the middle of the night. When he interviewed her, one of the questions he asked is, where are you right now? She said, here and everywhere, here and now. And, you know, that's, that would be a good Zen answer. You know, I wrote three books with Deepak Chopra. That might be something he could say. But when you say it as an Alzheimer's patient, it's a horrifying thing because you really have lost sight of where you are, when you are, even who you are. And he says she frequently cried during the night, oh God, I've lost myself. And that's what this disease does is, you know, all your life, you're making memories since you're born, creating really tens of trillions of synapses between hundreds of billions of neurons, and you're creating a neural network, a map of your world. It's like a tapestry. And this 
disease comes in and, and the pathology slowly just tears that tapestry apart. So, so in the brain, you, you start to lose context with really yourself and who you are. So let me tell you a little bit about how that, that brain works. And, and that is that, you know, when you, you, when you have sensory signals coming into your eyes and nose and ears, your five senses, these are electrochemical signals that get delivered to the brain. And they don't make any sense until you know how to interpret them. So when you're an infant, most of the things you see here, smell, have no meaning. The brain gives meaning to sensory signals and turns it into information, right? And then because of that information, you can recall it later on as memory. And those memories create a network of your world, who you are, how people know you. And that's how you see yourself, how others see you, your self-awareness, all depends on this. And this all happens in a part of the brain called the hippocampus, because that's Greek for seahorse, because this is the hippocampus down here. And as you can see, it looks a little bit like a seahorse. It's almost about the same size as an adult seahorse as well. But this area of the brain is where all this happens. And this is the battleground of Alzheimer's, where this area gets attacked. And so you know, a lot of people say, well, what about senior moments? When do I need to worry, right? These are just you know, cartoons about senior moments. I can't believe there's actually a, a real game called senior moments happening by that game and see that that's why. But you know, it's a big difference between senior moments and Alzheimer's disease. You know, if, if you're just forgetting a word or name now and then, it's different than having the inability to follow a conversation or put words together and speak coherently like an Alzheimer's. Well, maybe you lost track of where you placed something. But if you don't know what, what that something is even for, you, you lose track of what your car keys are for, never mind, lose them. Um, you, you know, or you can't perform you know, routine tasks like follow a recipe. This is when there's issues. It's okay to forget what day of the week it is or the date, but if you're really having confusion with time and space where you, at some point you can't remember even what month or year it is, that's more serious. You know, having occasional frustration or blues is okay. You know, and we all do. But having chronic depression, chronic agitation and frustration, not being able to, uh, you know, knowing that your brain isn't working the way it should. This is when you're making the leap to Alzheimer's from just, you know, age-related memory issues that come with time. Uh, just like our knees start to give out, you know, as we get older, I play too much basketball, my knees don't work like they used to. Our brain isn't as good as it used to be. Our brain activity and prowess peaks at 20 years old, 20, 25 years old. So, but it's pathology that, that drives this disease. And it begins with uh, preclinical AD, no symptoms, but there is pathology. So for 10, 20 years before symptoms, there's pathology brewing, just like cholesterol is brewing before heart disease. Well, we do something about cholesterol. We don't do something about Alzheimer's pathology that's brewing 10 or 20 years before symptoms. This then leads to mild cognitive impairment, where you can still you know, function every day, but you're having issues. And then finally, dementia, mild, moderate, uh, too severe. And it's caused by this pathology in the brain. So what you have are uh, these plaques, these gooey, sticky, boulder-like material that's in between the nerve cells. And then that causes the, sorry, my slides are turning up themselves. That causes these neurofibrillary tangles to form inside the nerve cells. And then you get these little cells called glial cells. Glia means glue in Greek. It was thought they just held everything together. But they're the little housekeepers in the brain. But when they see nerve cells die, they think the brain's under attack. They assume it's an infection and they start trying to wipe out that whole area of the brain. So Alzheimer's, you know, you have plaques and tangles and, and, and we believe that in Alzheimer's, the plaques really start to come first, up to 20 years or more before symptoms. And the plaques then lead to what's called telepathy or tangles. And then as the nerve cells die due to these tangles, that causes the brain to react with neuroinflammation. And neuroinflammation kills 10 to 100 times more nerve cells than the plaques and tangles. So I like to say the plaques are like the match. The, fire, the tangles that form inside the nerve cells are like brush fires and they spread and propagate for decades. But every time they start a forest fire somewhere, that's neuroinflammation. That's when you're starting to lose many more nerve cells and synapses to get to the disease. Now, you can also get tangles this way. You can have frontal lobe dementia, Pick's disease, lots of bangs to the head. Then you don't need amyloid to get there. So there's other forms of dementia that go through tangles, but the match is different. It's actually bangs to the head. In Alzheimer's, the most common form of dementia, amyloid plaques are the match that drive this disease. And this all begins very early. And the first four genes we found for Alzheimer's, and I was involved with finding all three of the first uh, familial early onset genes here, APP, 
PCNR1, PCNR2, these, all these genes contain rare mutations, nearly 300 of them, that guarantee Alzheimer's, okay? These are mutations that when you get them, um, the, the majority of them guarantee Alzheimer's. There are some mutations in these genes that don't guarantee Alzheimer's, but most of them guarantee it. So these are the hard-headed ones, and it usually strikes under 60 years old. Now, APOE4 is the late onset risk factor. It's in 20% of the population, the E4 variant. 20%, but it's in 60% of patients. And we have one copy from one parent that increases your risk fourfold. Two copies increases risk up to 14. But what all four of these genes have in common is that they all lead to more amyloid plaque deposition in the brain and for various reasons. Uh, the most common reason, reason I'll get to later on is this ratio of bad, the long, really bad data to the shorter AB. Okay, so we have a drug for that that we can work on. So what we've learned though is, and you probably all know this, if you're here and you care about Alzheimer's, you know that there have been failures after failures after failures. Most trials today and over the past 20 or 30 years have targeted amyloid, right? And most of them have failed. We have some hope now for aducanumab from Biogen, Denanumab from Lilly. These are, these are antibodies, immunotherapies meant to clear amyloid from the brain. Maybe you're seeing some cognitive benefit there. It's still, the jury's still a little bit out on that, but at least there's some hope. But for the most part, the reason why these amyloid trials failed is if you follow this red line here, the amyloid deposition, like I said, begins 15, 20, or more years before dementia. So by the time you get here, where dementia started, with this, this dashed line going vertically, plaques have already peaked. The brain's already full of plaques. So what you're doing is you have a brain that's full of plaques, it already has tangles, it already has inflammation, and it, so you have a forest fire of neuroinflammation killing all these nerve cells, and what are you trying to do? You're trying to blow out the match, which was amyloid, and you're wondering why it doesn't work. Or you're, and, or you're trying to stamp out the brush fires, which are the tangles. So what I'm going to tell you, I'll tell you what I'm going to tell you right now. If you want to treat Alzheimer's right now and help patients who are suffering, you have to get neuroinflammation, put out that fire, or protect the nerve cells from neuroinflammation. If you want to prevent Alzheimer's disease itself in the future, you have to know that plaques and tangles are forming in the brain decades before symptoms and stop them then. Just like heart disease, right? Um, Cholesterol starts to accumulate decades before you're going to get heart disease, but we take cholesterol meds or we change our diet or we, you know, or take other measures to lower cholesterol. We need to learn to do the same thing for the early initiating pathology of Alzheimer's, plaques and tangles. We can't wait until neuroinflammation is just completely burning down the forest of the, the, uh, the neural network in the brain. So that's the elephant in the room. We do not today diagnose Alzheimer's disease. So the brain is degenerated to the point of dysfunction. Imagine if we did the same thing with diabetes and heart disease. I mean, even cancer, we detect as early as we can. Diabetes, glucose, insulin, heart disease, cholesterol. What if we could detect Alzheimer's decades before symptoms and nip it in the butt? I guarantee you, this is what we'll be doing in the future. Hopefully the near future. Hopefully next century, they'll look back and they won't believe that we waited for the brain to degenerate by the time we tried to treat it and bring it back. Those seem to be, those seem absolutely nuts. So this is going to be the mantra. And this mantra has been the mantra of Cure Alzheimer's Fund since Cure Alzheimer's Fund started. We need early prediction using genetics. That's why genetics is our foundation to say, who, what is your risk? What's your family history? What's your polygenic risk score using your whole genome sequence? Something we're doing now at the McCann Center for Brain Health. And then based on that prediction, we'll say, Here's when you need to start looking in your brain or by blood test, it's now in your lips, for early detection of plaques and tangles decades before symptoms. I like to say, take your family history, take the age of the earliest person in your family who's a first degree relative that may have gotten Alzheimer's, subtract 20 years from that, and that's minimally when you should start trying to detect early pathology. Of course, you would say, well, what good is that if I can't do anything about it? We need to make it actionable. We need early intervention. Well, guess what? We do have pretty good drugs for hitting amyloid. And one of the big problems today is the FDA wants us to take drugs that are hitting amyloid that you need to treat 20 years before symptoms, but they want us to use them on patients now and make them cognitively better. So there's a disconnect between how scientists and clinicians are thinking about the disease and the FDA is thinking about the disease. And this needs to be fixed. It's kind of like somebody has congestive heart failure and a heart attack. 
And imagine they go to, and imagine the FDA says, I want you to show that Lipitor is going to make that heart disease patient with congestive heart failure better. No, you hadn't used that 20 years before. We need to get that to happen now in the, in the research world, the clinical world, and with the FDA to get to early detection, early intervention. And we have ways to detect Alzheimer's before symptoms with brain imaging. We have new blood tests um, to detect, that they're able to tell you whether you have amyloid or tangles in the brain. We have a blood test that tells you whether neurons are already done. Okay, new blood tests coming. I, I work with a company called React Neuro that has a, a, a device that does eye tracking, voice analysis, and a virtual reality neuropsych exam and an algorithm that assesses your brain health and then a more specific algorithm for detecting Alzheimer's disease severity or early symptoms of Alzheimer's disease. So whether it's brain imaging, blood tests, or digital technologies, they're all in the works. We'll be able to tell you if you're in trouble 10, 20, even 30 years before this disease hits. But we need to have early intervention. And what triggers this disease is amyloid. And all of the press you may read saying amyloid hypothesis is wrong, it's not like that. It's, it's not whether you should stop amyloid, it's when you should do it. And you can't wait until a full-blown uh, symptoms of dementia and Alzheimer's will be cured. So what we're, so we've been, you know, this is just a history of how people have tried to stop the amyloid. Um, uh, sorry, uh, gamma secretase inhibitors up top. This is, this is hitting one of the enzymes that makes amyloid. It, it involves these presenolin genes. They were unsafe because you can't just hit them with a sledgehammer. You need gamma secretase. It's an important enzyme. Beta secretase inhibitors were discontinued for safety, same reason. Amyloid immunotherapy, like aducanumab, more recently released denanumab, that looked like they have some chance of, if you use it very early in the mildest patients, maybe it's having some effect on cognition. They're expensive. They require image, image, uh, uh, monitoring with MRI because of safety issues, but they may be the first off the block to hitting amyloid. Pure Alzheimer's Fund has funded Steve Wagner and I to create um, a little white pill, a gamma secretase modulator, as it's called, this, this type of drug also stops the amyloid from being made, but it doesn't block the gamma secretase enzyme that's so important. Instead of hitting it with a sledgehammer, we tweak it with the Julia screwdriver so that we can stop the amyloid, but let gamma secretase do its job. Another drug I'm working on is the asthma drug, Fomalin, that was reformulated to get into the brain. It promotes the clearance of the amyloid from the brain. So, one, so we're going to probably see a combination of drugs that stop production of amyloid, and others that promote the clearance, like the amyloid immunotherapy, you know, uh, and, and, and uh, drugs similar to chromaline or other types of drugs like that. But I want to just mention, what if Abetis needed in the brain? Do we want to wipe it out? Is it, is it just a bad guy? And my colleague, Rob Moyer, some of you may have heard of, he, he, Rob Moyer unfortunately passed away with a, after a short battle with glioblastoma in December of 2019. An incredibly brilliant guy. Uh, he was uh, my, uh, a member of my lab and then started a lab in my unit. And he was able to discover that amyloid beta protein, which makes these plaques and not just jump. It turns out it protects the brain against microbes, that this little peptide of amyloid beta protein that makes plaques can bind to bacteria, viruses, fungus, anything that happens to make its way into the brain, even though the brain has a blood-brain barrier that keeps these things out. With age, that blood-brain barrier can lose its integrity. Bacteria from the outside, fungus, viruses can get in. And what will happen is what we showed in various studies is that in model systems, in animal models, we showed if you have the amyloid beta protein present, it can protect the brain against a whole host of different microbes. This is a picture. If you look here, these uh, orange things of uh, uh, fungus, candida. And the yellow is a web of amyloid, the amyloid beta protein immediately recognizes the fungus, binds to it, creates a web of fibrils around it. Well, guess what that web of fibrils is? It's an amyloid plaque. The fungus can see the plaque. A bacteria here in blue, I mean, in the back side, the bacteria here in green, with the blue now being the amyloid in this picture, um, can, can see the plaque. So what we found is, or herpes can also quickly see the plaque. We find that microbes can immediately see a new amyloid plaque in the brain within 24 hours if they get in. So that's a bad thing because you're making plaques and those can cause tangles and start the fire going, but the brain seems to need some of this. So we have to find a balance of not wiping out amyloid, but reducing it down to a safe level. This is just uh, 
the amyloid, the antimicrobial protection hypothesis. Now, I won't get into detail on this here, but what we believe is that plaques and tangles and neuroinflammation all evolved going back tens of thousands of years ago to protect the brain. The, the tangles in the nerve cells protect viruses from spreading. The inflammation in the amyloid uh, hit the microbes outside. The, the neuroinflammation takes a nerve cell that might be infected with a virus and kills it so the virus doesn't spread. This is all an orchestrated system. Well, along the way, gene mutations that promote this came along and, were, and then were conserved in evolution because they protected you. When there was a big epidemic 10,000 years ago, people were dying with some rampant encephalitis. Those who could make plaques tangles or have neuroinflammation more readily were protected. So we took those gene mutations that, that, that predispose you to Alzheimer's with us today and have to live with them but they probably evolved as part of an innate immune system as it's called for the brain. So the thing is we don't want to, we want to drive down the amyloid beta protein. Sure, it's okay to get rid of the plaques, but we don't want to wipe out this little peptide that probably has a real role. So how do we study it? How do we actually find new drugs? How do we do this? And Cure Alzheimer's Fund took a real chance on, on me and Julian Kim showing in this picture when we wanted to develop Alzheimer's in a ditch. We wanted to create many human brain organoids uh, in, in, in some cases, the size of a paper punch, right? That's a 3D little blob of gel with human nerve cells and other human brain cells growing in it where we put in Alzheimer's genes and create Alzheimer's pathology. And we were the first to do this, and we cure Alzheimer's fund a lot of us to do this. Now, we were able to create plaques in a dish and tangles in a dish and neuroinflammation in a dish, a whole process that takes 70, 80, 90 years in a person, you could do in just five weeks in a mini brain in a dish. And now this is gonna make drug discovery um, really 10 times faster and 100 times cheaper, much faster than doing it in mice. And Cure Alzheimer's Fund started a whole consortium just for us to screen for drugs using this model. So when we had to decide what type of drugs to go for, of course we want drugs to stop the amyloid, you use those early. We want drugs to stop the amyloid from causing the tangles and the tangle spreading. But if you want to help patients right now, I mean, hitting plaques and tangles is great for if you use them very early, and it's going to be the future of early prevention. But if you want to help patients right now, you have to put out that fire of neuroinflammation. And here's why it's so clear that this is what we need to do. Every once in a while, we come across what's called a resilient brain. Okay, so someone may pass away, you know, maybe. Uh, 80 years old, no cognitive problems, no signs of Alzheimer's. And then, for the shock of the pathologist, when they look in the brain, there's just as many plaques and tangles as an Alzheimer's patient. They say, how can it be? This is an Alzheimer's patient. No, this person was fine when they passed. No cognitive issues. But what you see in these rare cases, every single time, is that when you see plaques and tangles, but no cognitive issues, there's no neuroinflammation. Somehow, this lucky person had plaques and tangles, but it didn't trigger the virus fire. You had the match, you had the brush virus, no virus fire, no neuroinflammation. And because of that, the nerve cells survived, and you didn't get the symptoms, you didn't get the mention. And that says to us, it's good news. It means because most of us make plaques and tangles after 40 years old, especially after 50 years old. But if we can stop the neuroinflammation, we can basically stop symptoms. And if we can stop neuroinflammation in patients, we hope that we can help the brain to come back, to, to start to compensate. So um, this just this shows that, we, uh, that basically different genes we're finding as part of the Alzheimer's Genome Project, funded by Cure Alzheimer's Fund. Some of these genes, Alzheimer's genes, drive neuroinflammation from these cells called microglia. Some of them help the microglial cells to, to, to do good things, like clear amyloid. So these microglial cells, are, uh, uh, they can be bad or good, depending on what types of genes they're expressing. So we, we created all this in the dish, as I mentioned, and probably the most important model we made is this one where we can look at neuroinflammation. I won't get into the details of this, but here are some of made all this possible. So what you're seeing here is this is a, um, sorry, this is an index sized, index card sized plate with 96 wells, the size of paper punches. In each one, we do a mini human brain, brain organoid, and there's nerve cells here making plaques and tangles and here are the microglial cells ready to come in and cause inflammation. And now we can screen drugs that either stop the plaques, the tangles, or the inflammation. And in fact, if you, if, you, if you look here, you can see how the microglial cells can come in. You can see the whole process going on. 
You can see here a microbial cell eating a nerve cell. All of this is in a dish. All these videos are not in brains. They're in many uh, artificial human brains in a dish where we can visualize all these pathologies. Here, here you see on the left, green, the green guys are nerve cells. The blue guys are microglial cells. And these are healthy nerve cells. So the microglial cells are there doing their job. They're housekeeping, they're cleaning up amyloid and debris. But here on this side, what you have are nerve cells that are making plaques and tangles, lighting the match, setting up the brush fires. Look what the microglial cells do. They're eating the nerve cells. They're decimating those nerve cells. Because that's their job. Normally they're housekeeping. But if they see nerve cells dying, they assume for the worst. They assume it's an infection, even if it's not. And they say, wipe this part of the brain out. You gotta stop the spread of the infection. This part of the brain is compromised. This is evolutionary baggage, folks. This is, these are processes that started tens of thousands of years ago. But fast forward to today, where we live to 70, 80, 90, 100 years old, nothing's changed. When these microglial cells see nerve cells dying, even if it's because you're old enough to have plaques and tangles, they say wipe it out. And it's that neuroinflammation that causes the most damage. So that's what we have to really target. So that's what we're trying to do with our drug discovery. And I won't go into all the details. I'll, I'll just tell you the bottom line. We screen all of the approved FDA drugs that, that can be used in man safety. We screened over a thousand national products from all different kinds of sources, from uh, Chinese herbals, Ayurvedics, all kinds of uh, natural products that are out there. And this is the, the count we have so far, thanks to the Cure Alzheimer's Fund 3D drug screening program. We say 3D because these brain organoids called 3D cultures. We have eight new drugs and natural products that stop amyloid. We have 50 new drugs and natural products, 50, that prevent amyloid from inducing the tangles. That's an amazing thing. We can actually stop the, the amyloid there, but you don't get the tangles. It stops that process. Then we have 24 new drugs and natural products that either stop the neuroinflammation or protect the nerve cells from dying in the, the presence of neuroinflammation. And this is what's called ACT FAST, um, uh, an acronym for uh, clinical trials, where now we're taking all of these different drugs that we found in natural products, we're using AI, we're using uh, medicinal chemists, we're using pharma people, we're using clinicians, we're saying, which of these drugs should we start using in platform trials to start trying them in the clinic to see which ones work, because they're all safe. They're all safe. And the thing is, which ones do we start using now? And this all came out of a dish model because we can make drug screening 10 times faster, 100 times cheaper because of the chance to cure off on this fund to percent beings. And this just shows some of the AI-driven pathway analysis, the types of drugs that we're getting, um, how we might combine them. I, I don't have time to get into all the details here, but it, it's, it's uh, an amazing treasure trove of data. And I want to tell you one success story. This is a company called Amelix, and I, I, I did help start this company back in 2013. Two kids from Brown University came to me. They were undergraduates, and uh, they asked me for a meeting. And um, uh, I, I noticed that they were both Sigma Chi fraternity members. I was a Sigma Chi in college. And I said, okay. One of them was actually going to Milton. One of them graduated from Milton Academy, where my daughter goes from Massachusetts. And I said, you know, I'll take the meeting. And they had this very nascent idea about how to protect how to protect nerve cells from neuroinflammation. They read my work, um, and they said, you know, we think that, that, that this combination of this type of drug and that drug can do this. And this just shows the timeline of the, comp this, the, 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 the company they started, and I helped them. And literally, they were kids when we did this. And what we, what we realized was that in the cell, there are two battle sites where you have to protect the nerve cells from dying in the face of neuroinflammation. And, and, and that is the, what's called a, sorry, what's called the mitochondria, and the other one is called the endoplasmic reticulum. Don't worry about the names. The mitochondria is the battery for the nerve cells, the energy center. The endoplasmic reticulum is where you make proteins. So it's an energy consuming area of the cell. And what, what, what we argued was that when you have neuroinflammation, the mitochondria and the E, and this, what's called ER, endoplasmic reticulum, together, combine to kill the nerve cell, those are the areas you have to protect. It's like a bulletproof vest with two sides. One protects the mitochondria, the other protects the endoplasmic reticulum. So we came up with two drugs to do that, and we decided to do the first trial um, uh, on uh, ALS, and um, where you also have uh, rampant neuroinflammation. And uh, this is Justin and Josh when we get the positive results. 
This is me back then before the pandemic. I've lost uh, over 25 pounds since the pandemic, so I don't quite look like that anymore, um, I hope. Uh, um, that's one good thing about the pandemic is we're able to lose some weight by being home, eating healthy food, exercising. So um, these two drugs um, together, they're able to protect the motor neurons from dying through the neuroinflammation and ALS. And it was published in the Mineral Journal of Medicine and now uh, they're going for they're, they're looking for, for approval in Canada, Europe, and the U.S. And it's looking uh, very good. And uh, at the same time, we're doing a clinical trial in Alzheimer's. So the same two drugs can be protecting us neuroinflammation and Alzheimer's. That trial has been going on now for um, uh, quite some time. The Cure Alzheimer's Fund not only funded this company to get them going in the early days when before they, they, they had a successful ALS trial, but then when they did the Alzheimer's trial, they gave them funding to double the amount of patients in the trial, making the odds of success uh, hopefully higher. So this trial has been going on. It's only a phase two trial, but we'll, we should have the results in a couple of weeks. So we're all looking forward to seeing those results, hopefully in a couple of weeks, and we're, we're hoping for the best that uh, we repeat what we saw at the beginning of ALS and Alzheimer's disease, which is approached to protect nerve cells from dying from neuroinflammation. So, um, uh, so this is what we know is that if you want to treat patients right now, you need to protect the neurons from inflammation or stop neuroinflammation. But the future of prevention will be stop those plaques and tangles, the initiating pathology, decades before symptoms. And if Rob Moyer was right, maybe we'll find those microbes that are driving amyloid in the first place. We also have evidence of air pollution that drive amyloid in the first place. And maybe with primary prevention, we can actually stop the nipness disease in the blood even earlier than when the plaques and tangles uh, first appear, which would be secondary prevention. Okay, so what do we do in the meantime? Okay, I want to just end in the last five minutes. I don't want a lot of time for questions. With um, a, an acronym that I came up with after I wrote three books on um, uh, how to take care of your brain um, and um, self-help books with, uh, with uh, Deepak Chopra and. Um, and these, 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 all three of these books are already uh, published. And, and, uh, and the idea was to give people ideas about what they could do to make their brains healthier or, or make their epigenetics, their, their genome activity uh, healthier. The last book we wrote was about how to amp up your immune system and tamp down inflammation in the body and in the brain. But when I had to summarize what all three books said for how to protect your brain, I came up with an acronym called SHIELD, okay? And SHIELD stands for sleep, handling stress, interaction with others, exercise, learn new things, and diet. So let me go through these. It's during sleep at night that those little microglial cells I told you about, when they're doing good things, when they're beneficial, they clean amyloid plaque out of the brain, and the brain literally squeezes it out through a, a, a customized lymphatic system when you're in deep sleep. So you need seven to eight hours of sleep, even if, and it doesn't matter if it's continuous. If you take a good power nap, as long as you have REM, if you have REM, and then you sleep a little bit after those dreams, that's a rinse cycle. I call it mental floss, mental floss. It's when you rinse the amyloid and debris that's gonna trigger this disease out of the brain. So getting enough sleep is very important. Try, try for seven to eight hours. If you only get five or six hours, take a power nap. Handling stress, probably the most important thing. You know, stress causes nerve cells to die in the brain due to cortisol, stress causes inflammation in the body. We published a paper showing that meditation, a trial on meditation, uh, was able to reduce biomarkers for Alzheimer's um, effectively in just one week. And what we've learned is that in the brain, there's something called the default mode network. And this is the default mode network of the brain is the part of the brain that's turned on when you're basically ruminating or worrying about things or obsessing about the past or being anxious about the future, you know, when you're kind of stressed out a little bit. It's also the part of the brain that it, it, it determines who you are. It, it also determines ego, okay? It's, it's the default area of the brain that, that makes sure you survive, that you worry about what you should worry about, that you plan for the future and do what you need to do. But of course, you know, there's anxiety that can come up, that can come with that. There's obsessing about the past that can come with that. So that's why by your meditation, we try to become more mindful, right? It, the default mode network, it turns out, is exactly where Alzheimer's pathology starts and spreads. The more active the default mode network, those neurons will be more actively making amyloid leading to tangles and neuroinflammation. Alzheimer's pathology over decades spreads through the default mode network. So many of us now believe we should try to turn it off whenever you can with meditation 
or goal-oriented tasks, reading, doing a hobby, uh, 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 some type of work around the house, when, uh, gardening, cooking. Whenever you're in the moment doing something, whether it's meditating um, or during deep sleep, this turns off to the fourth mode memory. So what turns it off basically is mindfulness. And I like to use these, two, these quotes from John Cabot Zinn. Mindfulness means paying attention in a particular way, on purpose, in the present moment, non-judgmentally. See, the default mode network is the, is the seat of judgment, okay? It's what keeps you alive, it's what makes you who you are, but if it gets out of hand, it can cause problems. And John Kabat-Zinn also said, you can't stop the waves, but you can learn how to surf. I mean, you can't stop the waves, but you can learn how to surf. Um, so these are just a couple of quotes that I like. He also we also talk about the four A's of mindfulness. If, you don't, if you're wondering how to be mindful, awareness, pay attention to your experience in the moment without judgment, appreciation, pay attention to those around you with affection, compassion, attitude, pay attention to your outlook. To say, you know, right now, am I, am I treating people with kindness? Am I tolerant? Am I being curious about the world? What's my, you know, actually pay attention to your outlook and attitude. And acceptance, accepting the moment because you can't change it, but learning from the moment to plan for the future. So these are the four A's of mindfulness. And if you try to take some time to think, am I being aware? Am I appreciating? What's my attitude right now? Am I accepting but, but ready to change the future? This causes another analogy. Round of mild, mind, mindfulness that turns off to the full The eye and shield is interaction with others. Loneliness increases risk for Alzheimer's by twofold. Not being alone. If you're alone and you like it, great. But loneliness is another form of stress that can increase risk. Exercise. We, 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 we published a study to cure Alzheimer's funding that showed that exercise in Alzheimer's mice, even in the presence of plaques and inflammation, can make the, the mouse cognitively better. We actually figured out how exercise does this. And so we're trying to bottle <laughs> the effects of exercise on the brain. And we found you have to do two things. You have to induce the birth of new nerve cells in the hippocampus, well, that's called neurogenesis. And then you need those new nerve cells to survive and thrive. And that's why you need this growth factor called brain-derived neurotrophic factor. So uh, I'm involved with two companies. One is Promodex, the other is called the Cognitive Clarity, making these two uh, supplements here. And we're using these now in mice to see if we can induce neurogenesis with nicotinamide riboside, which is treniogen. And we're using something called cat's claw from the Amazonian rainforest in this product in the mouse to try to get the BDNF induced to keep the nerve cells alive. So what we did in mice with gene therapy without saying, asking, can we do this with supplements? And if it works in the mice and we're doing this now, then you know we won't say don't exercise, but we can use these supplements perhaps to try to do an Alzheimer's trial. We're already doing an Alzheimer's trial in the McCann Center with true niogen. And again, I want to state the disclosure on the fault of McCann's companies. Learn new things. That's the L. Right now, you're learning new things. You're making new synapses. And the bottom line in Alzheimer's is the more synapses you lose, the faster you lose it. So the more synapses you have, the more you can lose. So take time to build up your synaptic reserve, right? Making new synapses like money in the bank. Because the more you learn new things and reinforce synapses, make new connections, then the more those connections you can lose before you get into trouble. So I tell people, when you're going to retire, think just as much about synaptic reserve as you do financial reserve. Learn new things, not brain games. Brain games help you to focus. It helps you learn. But you literally have to learn new things. Uh, take up a new language. Take up an instrument. Watch documentaries. Read, read books that teach you new things. Whatever you can to learn new things in your brain. There are many ways to do it. And finally, I want to end with diet, because you're going to be having dinner soon. The most healthy diet in the world, based on data, is the Mediterranean diet, okay? So less red meat, more fruits, nuts, vegetables, leafy greens, plant fiber keeps your gut microbiome happy. I'm going to tell you why that's so important. It's a new and published data. It's very exciting. In the moment. So you want to keep the bacteria. You have trillions of bacteria in your gut, but your gut microbiome. People take probiotics to reinforce them. But the best thing you can do is give them plant food. They love fiber. This is called prebiotics. So what we talk about is prebiotics, which are the plant fiber. Probiotics, actually, the bacteria you get in yogurt or kefir or your probiotic tablet. A symbiotic is a combination of the two. You can actually buy probiotics that have prebiotics in it. It's called a symbiotic. So what we learned is that in Alzheimer's disease, I'll be very quick because I want to have five questions. Let's quickly go through this. In Alzheimer's disease, as the disease progresses, the gut microbiome becomes 
um, dysbiotic. You get an imbalance, so the brain is talking to the, the gut, the gut's talking to the brain all the time, the gut brain axis. And in Alzheimer's patients, you see that the, this, this gut dysbiosis, there are certain bacteria that, that get too high, like the bacteroides, certain good bacteria that get too low, like the ones you get in yogurt, the bifidobacteria. And the same thing is true in mice. If you take Alzheimer's mice in our lab, we discovered that, that sorry, we discovered that the same, bac the same bacteria that change in the patients change in the Alzheimer's mice as they get older. So we said, what if we change, what if we make the gut in the Alzheimer's mouse better again? Can we make the brain better? So we came up with a symbiotic to give the mouse. It's five different strains of bifidobacteria similar to what you get in yogurt. And then we use a, a form of fiber you get from a plant, fructooligosaccharide and inulin. We combine that together, we give it to the mice, okay? And what we found was that the symbiotic brought the gut microbiome of these older Alzheimer's mice back to normal. Okay, great, so we, we fixed their gut. So somehow the, the, the brain that, was, that has plaques and inflammation made the gut unhealthy, we fixed the gut. Okay, now what happens in the brain? Well, in those mice, we saw less plaques and less neuroinflammation by simply fixing the gut microbiome that the brain made sick. Brain made the gut sick, we fixed the gut, the gut fixes the brain again in these mice. This is kind of gross, but if you then feed those mice you fixed the poop, of, this, of the Alzheimer mice, so that brings their microbiome of the gut back to the abnormal state, they get the plaques and inflammation back. So this is very exciting um, uh, data. And in fact, I started a new company with Gary Rovkin, who's, who, 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 uh, who uh, discovered microRNAs, got the last prize, we'll probably get the Nobel Prize for that. But we're, we're actually took, took um, uh, from human feces, we isolated thousands of strains of gut bacteria and we're screening them now in models to see which ones are most beneficial for fighting against neuroinflammation. So we can try to treat the brain through the gut with very specific bacteria that live in your gut that you probably haven't heard of. These are the ones on the yoga can. And we're gonna to try to make uh, bugs as drugs with this uh, new idea that came out of this. Okay, so I'm gonna end then by saying that your mind and body today are the results of your habits yesterday. But the good news is your mind and body tomorrow are the results of your habits today. So you can always start to use shield at any time at the McCann Center for Brain Health, we use SHIELD um, uh, as a guide for telling people how to make their brain healthy. We do what's called an ideal brain score assessment to see how you're doing with SHIELD and then we guide you along the way. But, you know, just in case, this is how I tell you to remember uh, with these quick little guides, sleep more, meditate more, see family and friends more, move more, learn more, eat better than less, choose your ancestors wisely because genetics does matter as well. And I want to thank the Cure Alzheimer's Fund for this event, for funding my lab. There's a, a lab down on a, a yearly a boat trip in Boston, in Boston Harbor. And you can see the members of the Genetics Age of Research Unit up top, all my many collaborators and, and uh, funding come from Cure Alzheimer's Fund as well as other sources. But thank you very much for your attention. I hope uh, I can answer some of your questions. Thank you. Meg, you're, you're muted, Meg. Sorry, I was also frozen. Um, Rudy, thank you. That was great. Uh, we've had lots and lots of good questions. So I can try to feed as many of those to you as possible in our 15 minutes or so. Um, the first question is about biomarkers, which you touched on. But essentially, the question is about why and how is it so important and measurable to have objective diagnostic markers instead of a subjective diagnosis from a clinician? Well, you know, I mean, a, a good neurologist is pretty accurate for diagnosing whether dementia is due to Alzheimer's. It's not, I mean, it's, it's not so hard to diagnose dementia, but then the differential diagnosis say is it's dementia due to Alzheimer's. That means you want to hit the plaques early on. It's a little more difficult, but you know, for the most part, um, we, you know, with the biomarkers we have today, cerebrospinal fluid, you see actually the amyloid beta protein goes down when you have Alzheimer's in the spinal fluid. Why? Plaques in the brain are like Velcro. So the new amyloid beta proteins that get made can't get out because they get stuck to plaques. So in the sp spinal fluid is the lower levels of amyloid beta 42. And then you see higher phosphotolysis it's called. This is the type of tau protein that it's contained. That's going up. So they, so they can use that ratio 
of amyloid beta protein down tau up to save this plaques and tangles. Blood tests are reflecting this now. Uh, new blood tests from C2N company, Randy Bateman's company, just got cleaner approved, probably with FDA approved. So there's brain imaging that's been around for a while for plaques and tangles. So there are ways to see that you already have the initiated pathology of plaques and tangles. We're not so good at seeing neuroinflammation, unfortunately. But if neuroinflammation is there, you can be sure that if you see if the forest fire is going, um, you can be sure there was a match and, and, and brush fire. So you're going to see the plaques and tangles which represent that. But yeah, biomarkers are going to tell us how to do early detection so we know when to do early intervention. And um, I, I just hope that the FDA will let us use these safe amyloid drugs as soon as possible, trials of biomarker endpoints to start treating people in the Great. Uh, the next question I would like to pose is about the single infectious agent hypothesis. So you talked about uh, the different aspects of Alzheimer's pathology as agents of the innate immune system. There are people who are pursuing the theory that it is due to some single infectious agent. Can you speak to that theory? It's a theory. Um, you know, and we took it, we've taken it very seriously. When we found out that amyloid beta protein is triggered overnight, Fox are triggered overnight by microbes. You know, you can take Alzheimer's mice that are very young, four weeks old. They're not going to have plaques until six months old. We put salmonella or herpes virus, any type of microbe in their brain, we get plaques overnight. So we said, well, what are there infectious agents doing this? And is it just one? Are there many? So we spent a lot, we, we're spending tons of money and time taking post-mortem brains from people who had Alzheimer's, age-matched people who are older who didn't have Alzheimer's, and younger brains from people who may have died through some accident. When we've been looking, we've been looking for any infectious agents that are overrepresented in Alzheimer's versus controls. We have neither found a single infectious agent that's more abundant in Alzheimer's. We haven't found any agents that are more abundant. I mean, we did find two or three periodontal bacteria from the gums that were more abundant in one specific brain region of Alzheimer's patients. Um, so I, I floss a little more regularly these days. Actually, I floss every day anyway. Um, but we don't have a smoking gun. And I doubt, doubt very much there'll be a single infectious agent. This is a theory. I do think microbes can trigger this disease. But remember what I said, the plaques and tangles and inflammation probably evolved tens of thousands of years ago to fight microbes back when we were running around the jungle getting bad mosquito bites and encephalitis and meningitis all the time. We were living in a, unhygienic conditions. So those who can make plaques, tangles, and inflammation more readily, who had genes for that, survived. Now those mutations come, come here today, and now we have 70 different genes carrying mutations that can either amp up plaques, tangles, or neuroinflammation. Those probably help people keep stay alive 10,000, 20,000 years ago. They're driving the disease today. The question is, is it just genetics? Is it just environment? Could air pollution be driving it? Could microbes be driving it? So we're looking, man. We're looking every day for microbes that are smoking guns. We have not found them. I, don't th I think we will find them eventually, but we haven't found them yet. But I have to say something else. Think about a football player who had tons of concussions, who got chronic traumatic encephalopathy, CTE at 50 years old, okay? Those headbangs that caused the tangles that spread for decades came when he was in his 20s or teens. It took 10, 20, 30 years of tangles spreading like brush fires causing inflammation before you finally get CTE, symptoms of dementia, okay? What if? These microbes, these viruses, these smoking guns, these infectious agents are occurring early in life and they're triggering amyloid quickly and triggering, triggering, triggering tangles in some you know, acute infection that was unnoticed. It was a subacute you know, clinically. And then it takes decades of that pathology to spread. So by the time you look for the infectious agent in the 80 year old you know, post mortem brain of an Alzheimer's patient, that microbe, just like headbands, did their job decades ago. So you might not find it. So here's what we're doing. The laser capturing plaques, laser capture the plaque, open it up like archaeology. We're looking for remnants of microbes and infectious agents in the plaques now where they might have been trapped for decades. So we're not giving up. We're looking for them. But so far, we haven't found them. Okay. 
And no one's looking more than we are, I can tell you. <laughs> Um, so speaking of genetics, we've got a question about the rate of Alzheimer's for people who have direct family members, close family members who develop the disease and um, wondering what the rates are for them, for women in general. And, and we're generally, you talked about blood tests and, and lumbar punctures. Who should be getting tested for these biomarkers? Should everybody, are there people who are generally at higher risk than should definitely be getting tested? Yeah, so for the first question is, do you, do you want to know if the FDA won't let us have drugs that prevent it? Remember that, that, I mean, I got to emphasize that there's a big disconnect with the FDA. We need biomarker endpoint trials, okay? If, if, we're, if we have safe drugs, that we hope our gamma secretase modulator is, safe drugs that lower amyloid, we have to do that 10, 20 years before symptoms. If the FDA says treat a patient who already has dementia and get rid of amyloid and make them better, that's like saying take this patient with congestive heart failure, give them Lipitor and bring their heart back to normal. Oh, my internet's unstable. Can you hear me okay? Yes. I said my internet was unstable. Did I cut out? No, yeah. you're okay. Okay. So what I'm saying is that, that yeah, what I'm saying is that you, we need to, to test for early detection using biomarkers so that we can make it actionable and have drugs that are safe ready to bring that pathology down. Just like you take a statin when you have high cholesterol, the FDA has to allow us to do that. But so far they haven't, but we're fighting every day to make that happen. Biomarker endpoint trials, that's going to stop this disease, okay? So, but given that we don't have the drugs yet to do this, there's SHIELD, at least you can ramp up SHIELD if you find out. So you might get your biomarkers tested, and say, well, we're waiting for the drugs, I'll sleep more, I'll change my diet, I'll finally get my act together, right? Well, when should you then do these biomarkers? I, I mentioned this earlier, look at your family history, okay? If you have first degree relatives with this disease, take the age at which they had onset, which might have been earlier than when they were diagnosed, because sometimes you don't diagnose it as early as you should. So let's say someone had onset 72, but you said, you know, 67, 68, they were already showing some signs. Subtract 20 years from 67, because that's when the pathology is beginning, at least 20 years. And now that means at about 45, 47 in that family, you want to get your biomarkers checked, because that's when you might start, might start seeing the amyloid and tango starting. Someday this will be routine. Someday it will be so routine. You, 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 you know, right now you go to the doctor, you get a physical, you don't get a mental. That's why we have the McCann Center for Brain Health. We want to come up with ways to quantify brain health digitally, every, you know, blood biomarkers every which way to tell you what's going on. And someday we'll do that, but it has to be actionable as well. Some people just want to know. Some people say, I don't want to know until I can do something about it. But we have to dovetail those two together. But the question of who and when, especially if you have a family history, 20 years before the most suspected age of onset and the youngest first degree relative. Okay, so I've just been told we have time for about two more questions. Um, so uh, we had a question about inflammation that um, you talked a lot about the importance of neuroinflammation and you talked a lot about the importance of a healthy diet. And I think a lot of people wonder if I eat a diet that I'm being told is less inflammatory and I bring down my peripheral inflammation levels, does that directly affect the level of neuroinflammation that I might have? Yes, but they're not necessarily connected. So when you eat a healthy diet, um, no junk food, less sugar, less fat, right? Less processed foods, more organic, less meat, more vegetarian, more plant-based, Mediterranean. When you do all that, yes, it will tamp down peripheral inflammation, but it will also help the brain in terms of neuroinflammation. But, it's, but we don't have evidence it's through the peripheral inflammation going down. Okay, it may, it, we think it's a more direct gut brain axis. Okay, vagal nerve um, factors from the micro from the gut microbiome directly to the to the brain through blood. Um, so we don't have enough data to say that peripheral inflammation, like I have inflammation in my knee every day from playing way too much basketball way too late in life, right? But that's not making me more more risk for Alzheimer's disease. So we don't have that connection yet. Um, we're still looking. 
But the fact is, if you make your gut microbiome happy, it's going to help with peripheral inflammation and brain inflammation, but not necessarily connecting the two. Okay. Um, I, for our last question, uh, and I do want to let people know who have asked about clinical trials and participating in research, Cure Alzheimer's Fund can help you find your local Alzheimer's disease research center, which are federally funded centers that sponsor patient registries and clinical trials. So uh, we would be happy to help you find your local one if you want to reach out to us. Uh, but uh, we have a question or a, a number of questions that I could tie together that are essentially what are the things specifically that you would recommend to delay onset for people who are at high risk? Shields, 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 you know, um, seriously, get more sleep, start a meditation practice, try to be more mindful, do not obsess or worry, stress, kills neurons and cortisol. That causes more inflammation, it makes things worse, okay? So sleep, handle stress. Um, exercise. Exercise actually triggers enzymes to eat amyloid plaque and get rid of it. Exercise also induces the birth of new nerve cells in the hippocampus. It induces the, the growth factors of BDNF to keep those nerve cells uh, healthy. And so exercise is very important. Um, and again, like I said, building up synaptic reserve, learning new things. But diet is so important, man. Plant-based diet, plant-based diet, Mediterranean diet, get away from the red meat. Uh, I've been vegetarian um, since college. I did it for a girlfriend originally, I'll admit it. But I, I felt so much better, I never went back. Um, but, you know, uh, the, the, you know cut, cut out the, 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 the foods that can cause oxidative stress in the body, that can disrupt your gut microbiome. Um, I, I, I have supplements I recommend to family and friends. I don't talk about them in, in my lectures because, you know, supplements are always a touchy thing because there's too much snake oil out there and no one knows what's good or bad. Most of the things you see advertised on TV are bad, just so you know, okay? Um, so I, I, if people ask me, I, I'll send them my list of supplements and natural products that came out of our Alzheimer's in a dish screen. Um, I share them with local professional sports teams to help their brains that are making maybe tangles a little too often with headbangs. Um, so that's that's what I do personally. I do shield and I have a supplement regimen I take and, and diet, especially. All right, well, Rudy, thank you as always. This was fantastic. Uh, and we are now going to get to hear from Chris Mann. Yay. Thank you. Yeah. Hi everyone, I'm Chris Mann. I'm so excited to be back here tonight with you to support the incredible Cure Alzheimer's Fund. I've had the pleasure of supporting them in the past and um, it's such a worthy cause. So thank you tonight to all the sponsors for making this event possible and thank you for being here. Some of you may know me from my work with Cure Alzheimer's Fund or perhaps as the Phantom of the Opera or from The Voice or maybe from my very strange uh, quarantine parodies that have blown up all over the internet this past year, ranging from the classic my, 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 my Corona to the Adele one where I've smushed my face up. Hello from the inside. It's been an interesting year. That's all I can say. Uh, sorry for dominating your Facebook feed with those, but um, it's definitely been fun to make people laugh during this difficult time. I have a great relationship with Cure Alzheimer's Fund that started um, close to 10 years ago where I met Dr. Rudy Tanzi on the road while we were both promoting our PBS television specials. Um, I was about to go live with my pledge drive right after him and I was hearing him talk about super brain and the activities you can do to keep your brain sharp to prevent Alzheimer's and um, I had to talk to him. I have a strong family connection with Alzheimer's disease. My dad's mom had it in her 40s and, went, and was institutionalized um, which is terrifying to think about. So I never knew her and it really destroyed the family. So it's something I've always feared, um, plaguing him and then perhaps plaguing me, my sister, I don't know. So I wanted to talk to him more. So we ended up, um, talking over copious drinks, whiskey, really late, um, and forged a friendship, uh, and partnership that has lasted us to this day and brought me here tonight. We decided to write a song together, an anthem to cure Alzheimer's, that was funded by uh, the Cure Alzheimer's Fund called Remember Me. And this was a special moment in time for me 
in particular um, to see how this song went out into the world and impacted so many people. Uh, if you haven't seen it, I'm going to perform it for you tonight, but um, and I'll show you some of the video as well. But at the time, I was starring in The Phantom of the Opera, and I um, opened the invitation to some of my castmates to help make a music video that would portray artistically uh, what it must be like to be trapped inside a body that's being played by Alzheimer's. So we, um, one of our dancers, Christina Dooling from the Court of Ballet, she agreed to be choreographed and to perform this modern gorgeous dance piece while uh, as a old woman that is plagued with the disease. So my makeup artist who would do my prosthetics uh, donated his time and makeup to um, age her where she would get younger as the song progressed. So we would ultimately see that there's there's still that the young, healthy person, woman inside this body. She's still there and she's begging, please do not forget me. Uh, it's a very powerful message. The viral, uh, the video went out and immediately went viral. Uh, we had everyone from Mark Jacobs to Cindy Crawford to CNN, Rolling Stone covering this. It was an amazing uh, press for Cure Alzheimer's Fund. It was beautiful to see uh, the world coming together over this awful disease and, and commiserating together over this song. And um, we raised some money for research. So of course, 100% of the donations go directly to research with Cure Alzheimer's Fund, which is such an amazing thing. So um, not only did we receive money from sales of the song, but uh, Broadway Cares Equity Fights AIDS, uh, the cast of Phantom of the Opera matched that donation. Um, and I believe they donated $10,000 as well. So it was just such a win. And I would love to sing it for you tonight. Um, and again, thank you so much for being here. Thank you so much to our hosts tonight, Alicia and Sam Brash and Kate and Mark Shaw. Thank you guys. I need someone to hold, to hold on for me, to what I can't seem to hold on to. The life we used to live is slipping through my fingertips like a thread that's unraveling. I suppose that nothing lasts forever. And everything is lost in its time When I can't find the words that I'm trying to speak When I don't know the face in the mirror I see When I feel I'm forgotten and lost in this world Won't you please Worth not forgetting. 
I can't.